So we uh, are not doing a, a series today. Uh, we've been doing a lot of different series. So today we're just going to look at this message of running the race. Running the race. The running the race of our faith. So let me ask you this. How many of you saw this race or even knows what this race is? Anybody see this? Yeah, yeah some of you did. The Preakness. I'm not a huge horse race fan, but I do try to watch sometimes the triple crown races, and this is one of them. And so if you um, watch the, this race this year, one of the things, you know, people usually focus on who's in the lead, who's in the lead. One of the things that happened this year is a horse dumped its rider uh, <laughs> at the gate and just kept running, <laughs> right? And that horse just kept running. And people were just sort of, I was amazed by that. And uh, as I thought about that, it's like this horse has no idea he's in a race called the Preakness. He doesn't know that there's, uh, you know, something to be won, that there's a finish line, that there's a reward, that people are betting on horses. He doesn't know all that. He's just running because he's a horse, and horses run. And as we think about our faith and running the race of our faith, um, sometimes it can be like that. We're just running, just going along because everybody else is running, and that's what I do as a Christian. And if I do that, though, as we're going to see in this message, that I'm going to miss a lot because the race of our faith isn't just running to run, but there's a focus and a place we, wanna, we want to look at. So we're going to take uh, the message from this scripture in the, in the book of Hebrews, and it says this, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So there we don't see just, you know, we just run to run. There's something we fix our eyes on. There's, there's, a, there's a target end, and it's Christ himself. It's not a theory, it's not an idea, it's not an object, it's God the Son. And so that's our aim, that's where we're going. So when we think about this idea of sports metaphors that we're looking at, and you know, in the first century, and we see in Scripture, and I'm going to throw a few Scriptures up there that, that just give you a smattering idea of the sports metaphors that are in the New Testament, that people related to that because they saw the Olympic Games, they saw that, and they could relate that to their faith, and we can obviously uh, relate to it too. We have sports as a big thing in our culture. And so we're not going to read all those, just kind of give you an idea that there are several sports metaphors about our faith. But one of the things to remember when we're looking at a, this metaphor is there's no one person is the winner in this race. In the race of our faith, we all want to cross the finish line. So if one of us is stumbling or having a problem, we want to help them up. We want to get everybody to the finish line. We all can get to the end. We all win a prize. The prize is Christ. And the other thing is, um, we don't have to be qualified. In fact, we're not qualified for this race. Uh, but Christ is the qualifier, and he qualifies us. So as we think about a race, you know, we think about, well, what do we need? We need instructions. And, you know, this wild thing happened that, as I thought about the instructions, and we're going to look at three of them, that I got this idea no human being has ever had. Okay? I will take the first letter of every instruction, and it will spell out a word. That's, no one's ever thought of that. Yeah, I got to copyright it. It's never been thought of. And uh, as I told the last service, if you're new here today, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll see I have kind of a weird sense of humor. Uh, but as we, as we go through these instructions, we want to remember they're not really steps that we take. We do one and we're done. We take the next one and we're done. No, that it's a process. And there goes that heavenly music again, which I shouldn't, I shouldn't say why, why that comes in. It just, I think it's God. It just wants to say, it's actually an error message. 
<laughs> is that what it is? Okay. So, <laughs> so it's not a step. It's really a process. These instructions we'll keep doing over and over and over again and following those instructions over again in our walk, in our run of faith. So we want to keep that in mind. So now as we look at the first letter, R, okay, for our first instruction, let me ask you this. So there's two people up there, Jim Marshall, Mike Lewis, who I could not find a picture of, which is, I couldn't believe it with the internet. We want to find out what do they have in common. Now, I'll tell you, Mike Lewis is not a football player. So there's something else they have in common. Does anybody know? Yeah, nobody knew at the last service either. That's okay. <laughs> kind of obscure news things. But uh, what, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> they're, no, they're not pastors. They have the wrong way attached to their name. The wrong way attached to their name. So... So Jim Marshall, in a game in the 1960s, he picks up a fumble, and he starts running to the end zone. Man, he's going. No one's chasing him. He's going for the touchdown. And, of course, he ran the wrong way into the wrong end zone. And then Mike Lewis, he was a student in uh, Germany, and uh, he was spending some time in Germany. He was coming back home to Oakland, California, and he this was in 1985, and he's in London Heathrow waiting to hear what plane to get on. And he hears, oh, this plane for Oakland. He gets on it, and as they take off, and after a while he realizes he's not going to Oakland, California. He's going to Auckland, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and when he went to Auckland, uh, uh, the media somehow got a hold of this, and it, he ended up on Johnny Carson. He had to get an agent. All kinds of goofy stuff happened and he got his 15 minutes of pain and fame. <laughs> so when we think about instructions for running, this seems so basic, but we want to make sure we're running the right way, not the wrong way. And when we, look, we go back to our, our scripture in Hebrews, it says, let us run the race marked out for us. The race marked out for us. It's not the race I mark out for myself. It's not the race... Uh, society tells me to run. It's not the race that you feel like your race, I'll do my race, we all do a different race. It's a specific race marked out for us because it's the only race in town that we're connected to do. We're made for. We're made for it. God created us in his image, and this race is all about a relationship with him. That's what we're made for. And so if we want to do that, if we want to know that's what my identity is, that's what my purpose in life is, is connecting with him, this is the best race to do. It's the race marked out for us. That's the one we want to stay on. And as we look at Paul the Apostle, and Paul the Apostle was a guy who decided he knew he wanted to run his own race. And his race was the race that many of us maybe have tried to run is the race of prestige, the race of getting a name for yourself, the race of being the best among your peers, getting the, name, you know, the right pedigree, the right letters after the end of your name, where people look at you and go, wow. And the Apostle Paul, man, he was going after it like crazy. He got the best teacher, Rabbi Gam uh, Gamaliel. He got under his teaching. He was going above his peers, being better than everybody. And he's like going at it. Yeah, that's the best race because I'll get the approval and the accolades of everybody around me. And one day, Jesus just sort of stopped him in his tracks and said, dude, you're on the wrong race. <laughs> you're going the wrong way. You're running to the wrong end zone. He didn't really say all those things exactly, <laughs> but he, he, he showed him that this, this isn't the right way that you're doing. And he learned the new way of of being in grace by faith and living with, to, for Jesus Christ and what that meant. That he no longer had to try to force himself to be righteous, to get God's approval, to earn all the things he thought he had to earn to be able to have his purpose in life and his identity. He had a new identity in Christ. And it was awesome for him. But then as he started other churches and sharing that gospel, that good news uh, all over, you know, churches, especially the Gentile churches at the time, were getting rid of their pagan gods and following Christ. And they're like, wow, this is great. But then there's, a, there's several churches. The one we're going to look at called Philippi, 
they were going along good, and then some people came in and started going, oh, no, 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 no. No, that's not the, that's not the right way. You're doing that wrong. You can't just believe by faith that God loves you and that you're in his grace. No, you got to earn it. You got to do all these things that are there in the Jewish religion. You got to get circumcised. You got to follow these laws and do all these things. You got to earn God's love. That's how you get righteous. That's how you do life. And Paul the apostle hears about this and he's like, oh, no, no, no. That's not the right way. I've been that way. I got the t-shirt. I've been there and done that. I've got a pedigree that's way above what those people are telling you you need to have. I've been down that road, and it's the wrong road. He says this to that church. He says, if anyone thinks, anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, in other words, in their own abilities, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. I've got the pedigree. I've got all the letters after my name. And I'm telling you that's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. Because that way just leads to a continual feeling of failure and always trying to live up to these standards that we can't live up to. And that becomes our identity. That becomes our purpose in life. And that can be very discouraging. And that's not the right way. That's not why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and rose again for us to live that kind of life. So we want to make sure the instructions are we're going the right way. And the second instruction is we want to unload. We don't want to be running the race, carrying all these heavy loads. Going back to Hebrews, it says, <clears throat> Let us throw off everything that hinders and every sin that easily entangles. Everything that hinders. All these weights, and there can be all kinds of them. <clears throat> they might be sins, they might be other things, ambitions, trying to get approvals, whatever it is. Material goods, careers, not that those things are bad, but if they become a weight that gets us not running the race, then they're a problem. So we want to make sure we unload. So as Paul, the, we go back to Paul the Apostle, his instructions to the Philippian church. He's saying, look, you guys got to unload this. And so he says this to them. He says, but whatever was to my profit, in other words, all that pedigree I had, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, it is by faith. He says, man... I found knowing him, nothing is better. And all that other stuff is a load. And it's a load of stuff I get rid of and say, that's rubbish. And he has to keep doing that, just like we have to keep doing that when those loads come on us, to keep saying, these are rubbish. Because when we're in the race, it's not, like I said, it's not just a theory, it's knowing Christ. It's, it's a relationship. And it's the relationship we were made for. And so when those loads come on us, we need to be like Paul and just consider them, these are nothing. Even though they feel really important and good at the time, if they're a weight that keeps us from running the race, they're not a good one. There's another guy named St. Francis of Assisi, several hundred years after Paul, and he was a guy who also was on his own path. And in the wrong path. And he was on, his father had money, so he had money, and he was a pretty big partier. And he got all, he would get all his friends together, and he had to be, you know, he'd out party them all. And, and he wanted to have a name for himself and be known as the life of the party. And so he had kind of had a following, and he had all these accolades to get the approval of his peers and, and exceed all that. And then he thought, you know, someday I want to be a knight. Why? Just so I can ride on my horse and have the knight garb. And people will go, wow, there's Sir Francis. Yeah. And those were his ambitions. And it all connected with the money and the money that he had in his family. But then 
he had this other pull. Like for the Apostle Paul, it was a very, you know, it was a very one-time thing. Paul went from this direction to that. For Francis, it was more of a process. And it was the process of he would have this time where he started to connect to his faith in Christ. And he would try to live that faith out. And when he would, sometimes people would make fun of him. And that would embarrass his father. And his father got so embarrassed and enraged one time, he locked him in a closet, chained him in a closet. And Francis's mother let him go. And he went right back to trying to follow his Christian faith and run that way. So his father said, all right, you know, I'm, I'm going to take care of this. I'll take away his money. And during this time, Francis, you know, when he was following his faith, he sold some things, some property, I think a horse, some other things, and he got the money because he wanted to fix up this little church that needed repair. And he gave the money to the priest, and the priest is like, threw it on the windowsill. He's like, I don't want to touch that. That's your dad's money. I'll get in trouble. So he left it on the windowsill. So at this time, as his dad wanted to get control over Francis, and, and um, Francis was trying to walk this walk, but he had the weight of the approval of his dad and the weight of you know, money and riches and all this stuff that it meant to him, and his dad, so that what they did is they had this, what they call an ecclesial trial. They had like a little trial in the church. So the bishop was there, and Peter Bardinoni, uh, Bernardoni was there. That's his dad. And all the people from Assisi were there. They wanted to mock. They wanted to watch. And they get to this day, and so the bishop thinks, all right, I'm going to throw out a suggestion. You know, for, of course Francis won't take it, but I'll start with that. And he says, Francis, I think you should just, you know, give up your inheritance. And Francis walks out of the room, goes into another room. A little bit later, comes back out, holding a bag, and he gives it to his dad. And what's in the bag is his clothes, and he's co completely naked. <laughs> and he tells, and so he, he gives the clothes to his dad, he points to the money on the thing, and then he says this, Listen, all of you, and understand it well. Until this time, I have called Peter Bernardoni my father, but now I des desire to serve God. This is why I return to him this money for which he has given himself so much trouble, as well as my clothing and all that I have had from him. For from henceforth I desire to say nothing else than our Father who art in heaven. Walked out of the church naked. The moral of the story is we should all take our clothes off and walk at a crossroads <laughs> naked. No, that's not the moral of the story. Actually, he didn't walk out of the church naked. The bishop gave him some clothing, uh, let him borrow some clothing to go out. And, you know, you think, wow, because that was a load for him. That was a load that all that stuff symbolized everything that weighed him down and kept him from running the race and experiencing the freedom of Christ. And he got rid of that load. And we think, oh, and then it was just happily ever after. He walked out that day singing, and then he gets mugged and thrown in a snowbank. And he gets his way out of the snowbank, and he gets back to the road and starts singing. Why? Because he got thrown in a snowbank? No, because he was still free. It didn't matter. That other stuff didn't matter. He was free of that load. And of course, as the years went on, he would have to keep unloading other times, just like Paul did, just like we do. But they, they, they got in the right race, they unloaded, and then the last thing, the last instruction is a narrow focus. A narrow focus. And I was reading an article on, on running, and it said, the, head, the headline said, running faster by focusing on the finish line. People who gaze at an object in the distance go faster and feel less exertion than those who let their attention wander, a study suggests. And we see that idea of why it's important to have a focus. When we go back to our scripture in Hebrews, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of of the throne of God. So it's super important, not just in running, because we're not looking at an object, we're looking at God the Son. We're, that's a relationship as we focus on Him. 
He's the perfecter of our faith. We grow in our faith. We grow in our love for Him. We grow in knowing Him as, as we stay focused on Him. And the problem happens is there's a lot of distractions, isn't there? <laughs> there's a lot of distractions out there that want to get our focus off of Christ. There's external, uh, there's external distractions. Like we, had, you know, we looked at with Francis, we looked at with Paul, that maybe we experience ourselves. The distractions of you know, all kinds of things, social pressures, political parties, um, you know, careers, all these, all these different things that come out externally that can distract us. But then there's the internal distractions. Internal distractions are voices that sometimes come into our mind. Things like this. What are you doing in this race? You don't belong in this race. What are you doing? You don't, you don't look like the other runners. You don't have the cool you know, running gear and the shoes. You don't look fit. You ever have that thought? Like, what are you doing in church? What are you doing serving God? You don't belong. You screw up. You mess it up. You, you shouldn't be in this race. Anybody ever have a thought like that? Yeah, I have. And when we think about that, we think, yeah, because the, who are the people watching us? We go back to our scripture. It says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Who are those people? Who are those people? Well, that's chapter 12. In chapter 11, uh, the writer of Hebrews gives us a list of who those people are in the Old Testament who had great faith, and they went on before. Now they're dead, and they're the ones you know, in the stands cheering people on. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Gideon, Samson, David. There's a whole big, bigger list. You think, wow, what would those people be telling me? Get off the course, right? There's big people of faith. I'm the screw-up. What am I doing in this race? But if you know anything about the Bible and you look at those names, you know that those people were far from perfect. They all sinned. They all blew it. They all got angry with God. They all were unqualified. So they, they're in the stands going, yeah, you belong, because you need God just like we did. We didn't qualify. You don't qualify, but that's okay, because Christ did qualify. He's there at the end going, come on, I want you. Come to me. Fix your eyes on me. I make you qualified for this. You don't make yourself. We go back to Paul, what he says to the Philippian church. He says, brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, meaning he's not at the finish line yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's saying all that stuff that tries to get me out of focus that I did in my past, that tries to weigh me down, what I have to do is I have to just keep putting it behind me and get focused back on Christ. And I have to do that all the time. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross and die to yourself and follow me. And that die to myself is that part of me that wants to run the wrong race, that wants to take on the wrong loads, that aren't any good, that wants to get out of focus. Because I was thinking about the, the whole idea of, you know, those feelings, those voices that say, you're not worthy, you don't belong in this race. I was thinking of uh, a book I had listened to recently on audio called Educated by Tara Westover. And uh, she was a gal that grew up in, in this mountain town, kind of, you know, in this religious community. And even smaller was her dad. Her dad had a mental illness, but she didn't know that at the time. And he believed, you know, everyone in the outside world, uh, even including some of the religious community that they belonged to, you know, were all sort of the enemy, the Illuminati or, you know, the communists, the socialists. He'd say all these things. So he kept them in his family away from any medicine and any, you know, never went to the doctors or the hospital. They had to deal with everything with salves and holistic medicine. And no school. 
because he didn't want them going to school because they'd get tainted. So she didn't go to school. She, and they didn't really have a home school for her. She had to sort of figure out how to read and do it on her own. And her oldest brother, not her oldest, one of her older brothers was verbally and physically abusive. And so he would at times just grab her by the hair and pull her into the bathroom, you know, if she had something on that he thought looked like a horror. And he would grab her and he'd throw her head in the toilet. And he would call her all kinds of names over and over. And after a while, she started to believe those names. And her dad wouldn't, nobody would stick up for her. They would just act like nothing's happening. And so she just grew up, you know, feeling like I'm all those things they said I am. I don't fit in anywhere. And as she got older, she decided to take a chance and enroll in college. And she went to BYU, Brigham Young University. And there she met a professor named Professor Carey. And he started talking to her and he's like, wow, you're pretty smart. And he said, you know, there's this opportunity to go to an internship in Cambridge, which is a very astute, you know, uh, college in England. And she's like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to go to that. And he they, it worked out and she ended up going. And she met a professor there, very esteemed professor at Cambridge. His name was Professor Steinberg. And when he met her, he was like, you're, you're a scholar. Right? He was just amazed by her writing and, her, and the way she would talk. And so she talked about, though, even though all that was going on, she, the voices for her were like, you don't belong. You're not that. And so there's, at the last day before they left Cambridge, there was this dinner, this banquet. And I'm going to um, play a portion of the audio book narrated by Julia Whalen of this, what happened and what her professor, Carrie, told her that I think will help us out because it fits what we're talking about. Let's take a listen. In late August, on our last night in Cambridge, there was a final dinner in the Great Hall. The tables were set with more knives, forks, and goblets than I'd ever seen. The paintings on the wall seemed ghostly in the candlelight. I felt exposed by the elegance, and yet somehow made invisible by it. I stared at the other students as they passed, taking in every silk dress, every heavily lined eye. I obsessed over the beauty of them. At dinner, I listened to the cheerful chatter of my friends while longing for the isolation of my room. Professor Steinberg was seated at the high table. Each time I glanced at him, I felt that old instinct at work in me, tensing my muscles, preparing me to take flight. I left the hall the moment dessert was served. It was a relief to escape all that refinement and beauty, to be allowed to be unlovely and not a point of contrast. Dr. Carey saw me leave and followed. It was dark. The lawn was black, the sky blacker. Pillars of chalky light reached up from the ground and illuminated the chapel, which glowed, moonlike against the night sky. You've made an impression on Professor Steinberg, Dr. Carey said, falling into step beside me. I only hope he has made some impression on you. I didn't understand. Come this way, he said, turning toward the chapel. I have something to say to you. I walked behind him, noticing the silence of my own footfalls, aware that my keds didn't click elegantly on stone the way the heels worn by other girls did. Dr. Carey said he'd been watching me. You act like someone who is impersonating someone else, and it's as if you think your life depends on it. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing. It has never occurred to you, he said, that you might have as much right to be here as anyone. He waited for an explanation. I would enjoy serving the dinner, I said, more than eating it. Dr. Carey smiled. You should trust Professor Steinberg. If he says you're a scholar, pure gold, I heard him say, then you are. This is a magical place, I said. Everything shines here. You must stop yourself from thinking like that, Dr. Carey said, his voice raised. You are not fool's gold, shining only under a particular light. Whomever you become, whatever you make yourself into, that is who you always were. It was always in you, not in Cambridge, in you. You are gold. 
and returning to BYU or even to that mountain you came from will not change who you are. It may change how others see you. It may even change how you see yourself. Even gold appears dull in some lighting. But that is the illusion, and it always was. I wanted to believe him, to take his words and remake myself, but I'd never had that kind of faith. You think about that, and he said, if Pro Professor Steinberg says you're a scholar, pure gold, and you are. If Jesus Christ tells us that we're valuable because we're made in his image, then we are, and that's the truth. He is the truth, the life, and the way. And so when we're going, you know, in this run, and those voices say, you don't belong, you're nobody, we got to remember that we're valuable to God. He died. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. Why? Because we're valuable to him. He wants to be connected to us. He makes it possible so that whatever we need, whatever righteousness, whatever holiness we need, he gives us. And so... When, when those words come into our minds, we got to do like Paul and push them down. we got to be able to say, those aren't true. Those are lies. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> so as we think about the instructions, running the right way, unloading a narrow focus, and also to remember that you know, that's something we need to do all the time, every day, probably. I do is keep doing those instructions. And as we think about that, come to our call to faith, just a couple questions and then we'll say a prayer. What weights or distractions are in interfering with the race for you? What will I do to stay focused? You can ask yourself. 